All right, our next presenters are Andrew Schwezer and Bradley Smith, and they will be talking about the impacts of soiling on solar, solar photovoltaic panel efficiency. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm Brad. So the problem we're looking at is solar panels naturally get dirtier over time, reducing their performance. And there are a limited amount of studies looking into solar PV soiling. And there are even fewer studies looking into solar PV soiling involving forecasting. So what we're doing is demonstrating the need to have more research and studies into solar panel PV soiling with forecasting models. So the use of uh, a forecasted model and comparing that to actual performance uh, is going to enhance the ability to determine the financial viability of cleaning as a method of uh, reducing impacts related to soiling. Uh, these studies will allow the operators of these uh, photovoltaic arrays to sustain the high performance of their assets. Uh, they will allow increased access to renewable energy and they will allow manufacturers and operators to better determine how their uh, assets will perform in various climates and environments. Our objective to develop a better understanding of soiling in various regions as you can see on this map, uh, within different climates, there are different levels of intensity of soiling. And also to understand the financial viability of cleaning and um, as a result of the increased performance due to uh, cleaning the systems. Soiling is the buildup of contaminants on the surface of solar panels. Uh, these contaminants include dirt, dust, snow, and other forms of particulate matter. As these contaminants build up on the surface, um, they prevent light from reaching the internal components of the solar panel, which reduces their productivity. And as they build up, they also make the panels hotter uh, when they operate, which also reduces their efficiency. As you can see in this image with the red circle, this panel is experiencing light soiling on the bottom edge. Um, and next to that is a picture of the same panel taken using a thermal camera, which shows that the soiled region is considerably hotter than the less soiled regions of the panel. PV Syst is a modeling tool used to predict how a system will perform if the project is built. It also accounts for several losses within the system, including soiling. And with this particular model, um, in the circled red, you can see that this system accounts for 3.1% losses over the course of a year. So to mitigate those, the effects of soiling, PV panels are cleaned. Uh, larger scale uh, systems are cleaned using mobile cleaners, such as pictured here. They spray water onto the panels and then run over them with a um, spinning brush and then a squeegee. And this is a video we have of that process. This site's in, located in California and as you can see, there's a lot of just dust that's um, collected on top of the panels. And this process can be done one time or uh, several additional times, depending on how dirty the panels are and how effective the cleaners are. So the production of electricity using solar panels is possible uh, due to the reactivity of silicon when it's exposed to light. Um, when photons with enough energy reach the internal silicon crystals um, in a solar panel, they excite the unbound valence electron in the outer electron shell of the silicon atom. Uh, this excited electron then moves to the conduction band where it travels through an external circuit which creates a supply of current. Uh, this current is available as direct current at the site of production and must be converted into alternating current for transmission over a distance. Several tools we use in our analysis, two being the uh, data uh, analytical systems, Draker and Locus. They are just used to monitor um, PV systems. Uh, additionally, we used RStudio, which is an environment for statistical analysis, uh, for higher levels of statistical analysis. And we also then used Excel to conduct a cost-benefit analysis. We chose to use R as the environment in which to do our statistical analysis because it is a more robust program than Excel. Due to several errors in Excel's coding, uh, it fails three accuracy tests. Um, when creating statistical distributions, when creating random number generations and estimations. On the other hand, R is an environment designed specifically for higher level statistical computing and there are a number of different packages that the user can load into their interface which gives it a wide range of functionalities. Um, 
In addition, R has a reputation for extreme accuracy within the statistics community. Temperature derated production or modeled energy production is an adjustment of the prediction of how a system will perform based on the location's weather conditions experienced during that day. And it's measured using a reference cell pictured here, um, located at the racking on the racking system at each site. Um, it's also loca located on the same plane to ensure accuracy. And this weather adjusted um, uh, model data takes into account the plane of irradiance which is how the light is hitting the arrays, the position of the sun, and the arrays position or orientation. It also takes into account the temperature of the cells, and uh, that's measured by a temperature sensor located on the back of the reference cell. And this is important because the efficiency of the panels change as the temperature also changes. So with every degree increase in temperature, the panel's efficiency degrades by 0.47%. We also had to filter out our data to remove outliers. Um, we did this by re removing data where there was data collected with significant long-term alerts, um, such as the alerts pictured here, um, system disconnect, and um, zero generation alerts. And we did this to ensure um, the accuracy of our panel performance. The data that we collected was time series data. And that's just data collected <coughs> over a time period, um, such as here. And there are several qualities within time series data, including stationarity. And stationarity is how stable a data series is over time. And if there are any trends prevalent within the data, if there are trends prevalent within the data, it's not stationary. And to allow the data to become stationary, we have to difference it. And this is done by subtracting the observation in the current period from the observation in the previous period. And our data needs to become stationary in order for our model to create an accurate forecast. There's also autocorrelation within time series data, and this is how observations are related to each other are related to each other over time, and how correlated their relation is. Um, with solar irradiance, the observation from the previous day can be used to make predictions on what the irradiance will be in the following days. And also noise is in our time series data, and this is just random fluctuations within our data. To account for these uh, qualities in the time series data, we use an ARIMA model, and this is, involves an autoregressive or AR model, which accounts for that autocorrelation. Additionally, it accounts for a moving average or MA model, and this accounts for the random errors and noise within our data set. And when you combine these two together, you get an autoregressive integrated moving average model or a REMA model. And this allows, uh, is a forecasting tool that allows utilization of historical data to create a forecast for what future values may be. And it requires a stable data set with limited outliers. And additionally, our model had an intervention, which, is, which was the cleaning of our panels. So once we've created this forecast for how the system is likely to perform into the future, we can compare that to our actual performance data um, that was taken after a site was cleaned. Um, we can compare these two data sets using a two-tailed t-test. Uh, a t-test tells us if the difference between two data sets is statistically <coughs> significant. And it answers the question, is there a real or measurable difference, or is the difference simply attributed to, uh, to random fluctuations in the data? Uh, for our purposes, uh, the t-test returns a p-value um, and in our test, a p-value that was less than 0 0.05 signifies that the difference between the two data sets being uh, compared is statistically significant. Once determining the statistical significance of the data, we can, get, can conduct a cost-benefit analysis to determine the financial viability of cleaning. And we do this by comparing the actual energy production versus our forecasted energy production and multiplying it by the power purchase agreement rate or PPA rate set within the contracts. We then sub take the actual um, monetary value generated by the system and subtract the cleaning costs and the forecasted production costs. So this is just a diagram of our um, cost benefit analysis. The first column is the timestamp, so the daily data that was collected. The next one is the cost of the cleaning. And then we have our actual monetary value generated by the system, and then our forecasted monetary value generated. And then the final column is our cost benefit, and the highlighted number down at the bottom is the first day that the value returns a positive number, and this is how many days it takes for um, our payback period to be. So the first site we looked at was Valdosta 1 and 2, 
It's located in Georgia combined. They're about a 1.4 megawatt system. And the entire arrays were cleaned except for the inverters, or the, except for the panels um, collect, connected to the inverter number listed. And as you can see, the back panel here, the back rows here are clean while the front rows are not clean. And some potential sources of soiling within this location are it's located in a grassy field with some farming nearby. Additionally, pollen is a significant contributor to soiling. These are the performance plot. The one on the your left is the performance plot. And what that shows is a slight negative trend in the performance before the cleaning at time 350. And then at that time, you can see an increase in performance due to the cleaning of the panels. The next one is our difference plot. Because we noticed the trends within the data, we had to difference it. And by differencing it once, it removed the trends within the data. And this is known as being first difference since we only differenced it once. Next, we looked at our autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation um, lag <coughs> plots. And what lags are is they compare um, values within uh, one observation to observations previous to it. So a lag of one would be comparing an observation in the current period to the one just the day before, whereas a lag three would be comparing the observation in the current period to the observation that was seen three before. So with our autocorrelation function on the left, we can see that a lag of three removes the, uh, the autocorrelation, while with the partial autocorrelation, a lag of one removes the noise from the system. Um, and then once we difference the series, we notice that a uh, lag of three removes the autocorrelation, while a lag of three also effectively removes the noise from the system. This is the forecast plot then that we generated um, using an ARIMA 213, two to account for the autocorrelation, one to account for differencing, and then the three to account for noise within the system. And as you can see with the red performance line plotted here, um, there's a slight negative trend with it. And within the uh, dark and light shaded regions, there's possible fluctuations within the data set. It's kind of hard to see. Um, but from here to here, that's our 66% um, level, where 66% of the time, if the data were to fluctuate, it would fluctuate within that region. And then the lighter shaded region, which goes from here to here, um, shows that 95% of the time, if the data were to fluctuate, it would fluctuate within that region. So Brad, the red line, the red curve is trending downward. That is implying that without cleaning, you'd expect performance to continue to decline? Yeah. Okay. Then we can plot on top our actual data production. And at the time of the cleaning intervention where the red line starts, the actual performance of the system was at, a, was at 101%. And then immediately following the cleaning, it increased 3% to 104%. And this was maintained for 107 days before the system performance fell back down to that pre-cleaning performance at 101%. These are the parameters in our t-test and cost-benefit analysis. The N stands for the number of data points within each set. The SD stands for the st standard deviation, so how the um, data varies from our mean. And then the mean is just the average of our data sets. Uh, the T is how far from the um, the data is from our null hypothesis, which we had at, set at zero, so no difference between our two data sets. And then the DF is for the degrees of freedom, and that's the number of different variables that were used to calculate our p-value. And the p-value is a comparative value used to determine the statistical significance. So with this system, we determined that the actual mean after the time of cleaning was at 97.8%, whereas the mean of the forecast was 95%. Uh, this resulted in a p-value of 4.4 times 10 to the negative 14, which is below our 0.05% reference level, meaning the data is statistically significant. Uh, then we looked at our cost-benefit analysis. We found that the payback period for this site would be 26 days, and our three-month cost-benefit analysis shows that an additional $3,200 was generated by the system as a result of the increased performance due to cleaning. So we noticed the visual difference with our data. There was statistical significance between our actual and forecasted production, and it, we determined it to be financially viable. So with this system, we recommend that it be clean around every 100 days because that's how long it took before the system performance fell back down to that pre-cleaning level. The next site that we analyzed was Oglethorpe 2. This is located in Georgia and has a capacity of approximately one megawatt. Um, at this site, the panels attached to meters one and two were cleaned. 
Some potential sources of soiling that affect this site are the farmland that is located nearby, as well as a lumber yard located about a mile away. So here's our actual performance data, plotted in black with our forecast in red. The forecast was produced using an ARIMA 111 model. At the time of the cleaning, the system was operating at 89.7% productivity and it experienced an immediate increase in, of 8% in production. <coughs> Here are the parameters used to conduct our t-test and cost-benefit analysis. Our average production of the site after it was cleaned was 92.8% and the forecasted production, had there been no cleaning, uh, was 92.6%. Our t-test returned a p-value of 0 0.0882, which means that the difference between the two different data sets is not statistically significant. Our cost-benefit analysis determined uh, no significant monetary benefits as a result of cleaning the site. So there was not a visual difference between our forecasted and actual production data sets. Uh, the difference was not statistically significant and uh, we've determined that cleaning the site is not a financially viable option uh, for mitigating losses attributed to soil. Next, we looked at Valley Baptist Church located in Central California. It's just under a one megawatt system. The entire system was cleaned at the time of the study. And some potential sources of soiling here are it's located in a much drier region of California. Um, so wind can blow up a lot more dust and dirt into the atmosphere, which can then land on the panels. Um, However, it's also located in a more of a suburban region, uh, which has a lot of more asphalt and concrete within the immediate surrounding area. This is the forecasted plot that we generated using an ARIMA 102 model. The performance at the time of the intervention was 89%, and immediately following the cleaning intervention, the performance increased 6%, and this was maintained for 48 days before the system performance fell back down to that 89% integral. These are the parameters for our t-test and cost-benefit analysis. Um, the actual mean of the data after the time of cleaning was found to be 87.5%, while the forecasted average was actually higher at 92.5%. Um, this results in a p-value of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16, which is statistically significant, but in a negative direction, meaning the forecasted was higher than the actual data. Um, within our cost-benefit analysis, because there was a negative statistical significance, cleaning did not yield any measurable benefits at this site. So there was a visual difference. It was statistically significant, but in a negative direction, and it was not determined to be financially viable. Um, therefore, this site does not present a justification to be cleaned on a regular basis. Our next site is E&B, located in Central California. This is a 1.1 megawatt facility, and the entire system is clean. As you can see, it's located in a pretty dry and dusty area of California. Um, there's also some nearby farmland. So here's our actual performance plotted in black with our forecast in red. The forecast was produced using an ARIMA 112 model. Um, and at the time of the cleaning event, the site was producing at 78% productivity and experienced an immediate increase in productivity of 7%. Here are the parameters used to conduct our t-test and cost-benefit analysis. Our actual average production after cleaning was 91.1%, and our forecasted average production, had there been no cleaning, was 71.6%. Our t-test returned a p-value of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16, which means that the difference between our data sets is statistically significant. It's important to note at this point that 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16th is the smallest p-value that, that R will return uh, as a result of a t-test. So you're going to see that value several more times, but it still does signify statistical significance. Our cost-benefit analysis determined that the payback period was 33 days and that as a result of the cleaning, the system generated an additional $7,100 in revenue. So we did have a visual difference between our forecast and an actual production. The difference was statistically significant, and we have determined that cleaning at this site is a financially viable option for mitigating losses attributed to soil. Um, since the production of this site did not fall below the 78% that it was at before the cleaning, uh, we recommend that this site be monitored uh, for sustained downward trends in performance that could indicate the cleaning is necessary. 
Next, we looked at the Corcoran projects, and this is a collection of seven different sites within the Corcoran district. It's located in central California, and combined, they have a capacity of about 1.3 megawatts. And some potential sources for soiling here, it's again located in a much drier region of California with a lot of agriculture surrounding it in the immediate area. Uh, this is our forecasting model that we created using an ARIMA 511 model. As you can see, there is a significant downward trend um, if the, there had not been the cleaning intervention. Um, performance at the time of the cleaning was 74%. While immediately following the cleaning, the performance of the system increased 17%. Um, this was maintained for about 80 days before the system performance fell back down to that 79% pre-cleaning level. And these are our t-tests and cost-benefit uh, numbers. Uh, so at the mean of our actual data set um, after the cleaning was found to be 83.9%. Well, the mean of our forecasted, had there not been the cleaning intervention, was 62.1%. This results in a statistical significance, again, of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16, um, which means there was a statistical significance between our data sets. Next, in our cost-benefit analysis, we determined the payback period would be 26 days for this location, where our three-month cost-benefit analysis determined that an additional $7,000 was generated as a result of the increased performance of the system due to the cleaning. <coughs> So there was a, a statistical significance within our data set. We noticed a visual difference, and we determined it to be financially viable. Um, therefore, we recommend that the system be cleaned at least every 80 days due to the fact that that's how long it took before the performance value fell back down <coughs> to that pre-cleaning level. Our next site is Orange Cove, also located in Central California. This is a one megawatt facility where the entire system was cleaned. So this site is located within some farmland, and it's also located within 1,000 feet of a packing plant, which uh, could be contributed to soiling at this site. So here's our actual performance plot, in, or plotted in black, and our forecast in red. Uh, this was generated using an ARIMA 011 model. Um, at uh, the time of the cleaning, our, uh, our site uh, had an increase in production of about 7%. And then about a month after the cleaning event, some broken modules were replaced at that site. Um, and that is the reason for that apparent step increase in production. Here are the parameters used to conduct our t-test and cost-benefit analysis. Our average production of the site after the cleaning event was 107.8%. And the forecasted average performance, had there been no cleaning, was 84.1%. Our t-test returned a p-value of 2.2 times 10 to the negative 16, which means that the difference between these two data sets is statistically <coughs> significant. Our cost-benefit analysis determined a payback period of 26 days, and we determined using our three-month cost-benefit analysis that an additional $3,100 in revenue was generated as a result of cleaning at this site. So we did have a visual difference between our two different data sets. The difference was determined to be statistically significant and we have decided that cleaning at this site is a financially viable option for mitigating losses attributed to soil. So as a summary, we noticed a visual difference between four of our sites. Four of them were statistically significant in a positive direction. One was statistically significant in a negative direction. And one we determined was not statistically significant. Additionally, of the four sites that we determined were positively statistically significant, those four were also all financially viable to clean. So we found that studies with soiling that include a comparison of forecasted performance to actual performance allow for a more complete determination of how long the payback period will be and also a better determination of how much increased revenue is generated as a result of these cleaning activities. Um, we also found that the physical features of the land surrounding a site as well as how that land is used can greatly impact the level of soiling and the type of soiling that that site experiences. We also recommend that sites uh, that have sustained downward trends in performance that cannot be attributed to uh, mechanical failures or issues um, be examined to see if uh, cleaning them would be a, a financially viable option for mitigating soil losses at that site. Uh, so future recommendation, recommendations for studies are to look at uh, local weather patterns to see how natural rain levels and intensities uh, are effective at removing the effects of soiling. 
Additionally, uh, studying the relationship between the types of soiling and the related um, impacts in decrease in performance. And a study of um, soiling due to snowfall and mitigation options for that. And an analysis of local factors such as farming and how that affects the performance seasonally um, within the system's performance. Here's some of our sources. And special thank you to Dr. Miles for being our capsule advisor over the past two years. WGL Energy for originally pitching the idea to us and allowing us to use all of their data. And uh, Dr. Radswell and Dr. Deaton for helping us with our, our analysis. Any questions? Uh, why did you choose those sites? Was that just because you had the data from there? or? Yeah, so that, there were several different sites that were cleaned um, by WGL Energy, and those were the sites that we had data um, from. So um, looking, so you get your six sites, and they all kind of have some, some different characteristics, and um, is there any conclusion that you all can make about any common characteristics that would indicate the viability financially of cleaning, like the proximity to farming or something like how, are those four that were viable similar or different from the two that weren't in any way? Do, um, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so a large part of that is sort of the physical characteristics of the land um, nearby. Um, you know, in California, a lot of it is, is dry and dusty and desert. Um, and that certainly contributes to dust that gets kicked up. Um, the sites that were located near farmland, uh, you know, of course, farming activities create lots of dust um, that gets, you know, airborne. Um, and especially during sort of the harvesting seasons, um, that also could create some additional impact. So I guess what was the component of the two that didn't become viable for cleaning? What, what do you think was the main factor that made them not financially viable for that? At least with Oglethorpe, there was not a significant difference within the data set. Um, looking at pictures of it uh, that we had, there was not significant impacts of soiling. They weren't significantly dirty. Um, so cleaning them may not have resulted in that much of a performance change. Um, and that was definitely having to do with some of the surrounding factors of it. And um, with the other one... Um, I think uh, a big that, factor might be the PPA rate. The, the electricity cost. So if you've got one that's five cents per kilowatt hour versus another one that's 20 cents a kilowatt hour, you're going to see that payback. And that's more of a cost variable rather than a physical yeah. solar panel variable. On the lost right. revenue. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'm staying in a dry, hot, dusty climate, but in the Virginia area where I live, you got four, I got 4 kW of solar in the backyard. I never have to clean it as long as I get a rain within a couple of weeks. A decent rain, it cleans itself. I don't see a performance drop. Or maybe it's just because my area where I live, but it, they usually clean themselves, but with a good rain. Yeah. Well, that, that's what we found is that sort of in the northwest and regions that mm -hmm. experience, or northeast and regions that experience heavier rainfall, um, you don't need to do this. You don't need to clean. Right. Oh, no, the cleaning is a good We have a snow. Right. To get but, there with a broom and <laughs> pull the snow off. Other right. than that, I don't have to clean them. Right. Well, the, the, the impacts of soiling are much more um, extreme and severe in these drier, dustier right. locations. Okay. Um, and these are also the locations that tend to have the better solar resource. Oh, um, yeah. They're drier, closer to the equator, um, typically less uh, moisture in the atmosphere. Um, Additionally, with Virginia, we get a lot more natural rain. Oh, yeah. than when you compare it to California. Um, so that's why we recommend looking into like the amount of rain and like, intensity of the rain um, to see how that would mitigate soiling losses. So you've done a, a fairly sophisticated statistical analysis here for what is a, a, a problem that I think anybody in the room can understand. Have you seen evidence in all your research that this kind of an analysis has been done before, or for that matter, what what have you found, if anything, drives other companies besides WGL Energy to clean or not to clean? Are there, are there other methodologies like yours? Or? Comparatively, um, we didn't see any, we didn't find any other um, study that had been done using this forecasting method. Mm -hmm. um, however, there is a tendency to compare. Um, so at least with Olgathorpe, 
the cleaning was done on the panels associated with meters one and two, mm -hmm. while meters three, four, and five were left uncleaned. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of uh, usually a one-to-one -one comparison using that methodology. Mm -hmm. However, um, the reason we didn't end up doing that is because different um, uh, like panels and inverters degrade at different rates and operate at different levels. So it's not exactly that one-to-one -one comparison um, mm -hmm. as you would see with a forecasting method like this. I see. Yeah, I, I also, just from WGL standpoint, um, what was nice for us is we always just did back of envelope, you know, analysis, mm -hmm. but to actually have a, an actual deep dive into the data, get rid of the noise, right, level set everything and come up with a, this is statistically significant, we should do it, um, it helps us as a business make, mm -hmm. make better educated decisions, so it was, it was great. I just had another question. I, I have to admit that your um, statistical analysis was awesome. I, I probably didn't understand 95% of it, but I had a question about your, um, you were talking about this three-day lag, mm -hmm. right? What, what is the significance of three days? Does it have significance? So um, if you want to pull up one of the pictures again. Oh, uh, down. There you go. Yeah. So what you can see with these pictures is this dotted blue line is a statistical significance level. And you want your lags to be below that level. And what these arrows indicate are number of days. So as we see with like the peak at this one, that's at, um, a, it peaks at like a lag three. And so that lag three is an indication, in, is an indication that, um, you should, that you should have that lag three to only compare maximum out three days. Um, so this is sort of that indication. So it's not only just like a lag three maximum. This chart is what indicates um, how many days out we should compare it to each other. Okay. So it's not specifically just a, a maximum of three. It, it could go up to as much as 30. Um, so you compare the observation in the current period to the one that happened 30 days prior. A lot of what this part describes is sort of um, preparing the data to be input into our REMA model um, so that it can provide accurate predictions. Um, just sort of like tailoring it specifically to the R program that we use. Um, I realize that it's kind of a result of the data that was available to you, but it seemed like there was really no, no real world, world difference in the sites. From my perspective, they, they were all in areas that had little to no regular precipitation. Um, I would have liked to see the date the system was installed and not just the date that it was cleaned so I know how old it was. Um, and I don't know if, if in your reading you ever came across any information on types of soiling that rain will clean and types of soiling that tend to build up over time and actually need to be scrubbed off. Because that 38 days, 48 days out, in my mind, is primarily soiling that's going to leave the next time it rains. Whereas if you're looking out two, three years, four years between cleanings, you start getting buildup that rain won't take off. And I don't know if you encountered any that brought up some of those kind of questions? Uh, there was uh, one study that had been conducted. Um, it was relatively old, though, um, like early 2000s, um, that looked into like the types of soiling and how after a certain period of time it can uh, like solidify um, within the panels. Um, and that's when you need like a significant cleaning or essentially write the panel off as like a loss. Um, but that's why we recommend um, additional studies looking into further um, the types of soiling that may occur um, within various regions and how long or how like that may affect the performance of the system. Uh, speaking to the age of the systems, they're all fairly new. Um, I don't know, when, how old is your oldest system, you know? 2013, that's okay. the oldest one in that group. So they're all within five years, five years old. Anybody else? Are there any applications for the data you collected for potential solar development from determining the geographically the best places to build solar projects? Um, not specifically. Um, I guess if you wanted to go into the place that had 
the least amount of soiling where you wouldn't have to clean it as most at, or as often um, that could definitely be sort of like a, a reason for choosing to develop in one region as compared to do another one uh, but not something specifically one of the sorry one of the, one of the reasons why we did this project was as I briefly mentioned earlier some of the best solar resource <coughs> is located in places that experience heavy soiling um, so like deserts and, and, and that kind of place like that and also have low precipitation I just had a really quick question. So after each one of your analyses, you made a suggestion of how often the panels should be cleaned. And I'm just curious, how, does, how do your predictions or suggestions compare to how often they were currently cleaning them? So the analysis that we looked at was just after the cleaning intervention of once, uh, one time cleaning it. Um, and so then we made our prediction based on how long that system performance was maintained above that pre-cleaning level and um, how long the payback period was. So you don't want to clean, so if we had a payback period of 26 days, you don't want to clean it every 25 days. Right. Otherwise, you'll never make your money back. Um, but that system performance was maintained for a certain period of time. So if with one of our systems, the performance was maintained above that pre-cleaning level for 80 days. Um, so at most, or as, at, as often, you would want to clean it 26 days, but at most, you wouldn't want to let it go past 80 days. And how often are they being cleaned? Now. Um, so like, most of these sites were cleaned once and then left shh, to collect. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so proprietary information, you'll have to sign on to slow no, <laughs> um, they, they, they were left dirty um, for, and in some cases, up, some cases up to a year plus, um, basically to allow us to have a wealth of data to do this analysis um, specifically for our capstone project. WGL provided us. Uh, with a lot of resources um, to get Did you have to pay them back for all that lost revenue? <laughs> <laughs> they actually paid us. I ran out of, yeah. I ran out of budget. I couldn't it. It, 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 I mean, they're... They did this to justify it. Their research is also going to inform our decision-making process going forward. Um, this was really one of the first times that we'd cleaned those projects in California. And, um, I mean, after seeing this and after having the general idea in my head that cleaning is paid back for us, um, it, it will inform our schedule going forward, especially now as we're getting into summer, because um, there you see a little bit of a, an opposite seasonality where like here you're impact with soil, impacted with soiling in the winter due to snow and things like that, and, and as you said earlier, Maine takes care of a lot of that, but in California you get the opposite, and where you get all the rain in the winter, and so you don't really need to clean as often then, but now getting into the summer. Peak getting into the dry but, season, yeah. and then when California has a drought for a year and a half, it leads up to all that soil, and yeah, that's, that's part of it. Cool. I guess I have time for about one more question. Anybody? Okay, awesome. right. Thank you.